Good morning. I want to begin by asking you to take a mental quiz. I'm going to ask you six questions. I, I want to see if you can answer these questions. Can you name the three wealthiest people in the world? Can you do that? Can you name the last three Heisman Trophy winners? Can you name the last three winners of the Miss America contest? Can you name three people who have won the Nobel or the Pulitzer Prize? Can you name the last three Academy Award winners for Best Actor or Actress? And finally, can you uh, name the last three Baseball World Series winners? Well, how'd you do? If you were like me, you didn't do very well. I was not able to answer many of these. What's my point? It's this. Very few of us remember the headlines of yesterday. And yet these questions that I ask, these are not second-rate achievers. They are the best people in their field. But the truth is, the applause dies. Awards do get tarnished. Achievements are soon forgotten. And the accolades and certificates end up being buried with their owners. Let me ask you very briefly to take another mental quiz and see how you do on this one. Can you name three teachers who aided your journey through high school? Can you name three friends who have helped you through a difficult time? Can you name three people who have taught you something worthwhile? Can you name three people who have made you feel appreciated and special? Can you name three people who you enjoy spending your time with? Can you name three heroes whose stories have inspired you? This series of questions was a little bit easier. You were probably able to answer most, if not all, of them. What's the lesson to be learned here? It is this. You see, the people that make a difference in your life and mine are not the ones with the most credentials. They're not the ones with the most money. They're not the ones who have won the most awards. The people who have made the biggest difference in your life and mine are the ones that care. They care about us, care about me, care about you. And fathers, I want you to hear me. You top that list. We top that list. As the song concluded, Cats in the Cradle, the father ends by saying, My boy was just like me. See, fathers, you're having an impact on your children. Now, it may be a positive impact. It may be a negative impact. But you are having an impact on your children, no matter what their age is or no matter what your age is. Yes. See, my father's in his 60s. I'm 37, but he's still having an impact on my life. And fathers, you're going to see yourself in your children. <laughs> and sometimes you're going to wish you did, and there was a little boy who just started first grade, first day of his first grade class. And it wasn't long before the teacher was scolding him for using an, an, uh, an inappropriate word, and the little boy said, but my daddy says that word all the time. And the teacher replied, well, that doesn't matter. You shouldn't be saying that word. Besides, you don't even know what it means, to which the little boy said, Yes, I do. It means that the car won't start. <laughs> you see, fathers, you, you are going to see yourself in your children. Let me invite you to take your outline out. And today I want to give you three steps on how you can become Father of the Year. And, and I believe truly that if you will follow these three steps, then your child or your children will see you as the best father they could possibly have. Not only this next year, but every year. These three steps are vital, are very important. Let's begin with step number one. If I'm going to become father of the year, the first thing I must do is give time to my children. If you're going to win father of the year, you must give time to your children. my children, then I've got to give them my time. And so do you. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 says, And now a word to you fathers. Don't make your children angry by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction approved by the Lord. I, I want us to focus for just a moment on a word in there. It's the word discipline. In America, we have a tendency to think of that uh, word discipline as punishment, as reproof. But the Bible actually uses it in a different way. The, the word discipline actually comes from another biblical word, the word disciple. And the word disciple means to teach and to equip. 
And so when the Bible is, is telling us fathers to discipline our children, he's, it's saying that we are to teach them, to equip them, to help bring them up. How? The verse concludes that we are to do it in the instruction of the Lord. That is, we are to impart in our children the truths, the principles, the relationship, the love of God. To put that into our children. The underlying principle here in this verse and throughout the Bible, if I'm going to equip my children or teach them, the only way I can do that is to spend time with them. Otherwise, I could just write uh, three-point sermons and just hand it, you know, put it on their door. That doesn't work. It's spending time with your children that has the effect, that has the impact. We've got to spend time with them. I find it very interesting, and I hope that you do too, that this particular song, Cats in the Cradle, which came out in the late 60s, early 70s, it's interesting to note that in our nation's history, the period of time that showed, demonstrated the worst youth rebellion was late 60s and early 70s. And research has pointed to the fact that during this time, parents were not spending as much time with their children. You know, in many families today, the father is seen as excellent or good at something. Maybe he's an excellent hunter or fisherman. Or, or maybe he's an excellent businessman or, or does a great job at his work. Or maybe he's a, you know, a real funny guy or maybe he's a great rancher or he's great at sports. Dads in most homes are looked as excellent in some area, but dads, let me ask you what may be a very challenging question. In your home, are you seen as the spiritual leader? Are you seen as the spiritual leader in your home? Ephesians 6, 4 says that we are to lead the way in teaching and equipping our children. And it goes back to spending time with them. And I, I want to share with you some, some excellent ways that you and I can spend time with our children. But I want you to know that I'm going to be talking in the context of spiritual depth. But that's not to discount that you ought to be going to their ball games and, and uh, taking them to the zoo and, and reading with them and, and going to the movies or watching your favorite TV, pro whatever it is you guys do together. That doesn't eliminate those things. Those are important things to do. But I'm going to focus my comments today on ways that we can spend time with our children, raising them up in the ways of the Lord. So let me give you some suggestions. First of all, prayer. Dads, have your children ever heard you pray? Have you heard them pray? You need to interact with your children through the avenue of prayer. They need to see Dad pray and hear Dad pray, and you should hear them. You'll know the hearts of your children that way. The other way is Bible reading. Bible reading. Um, being a pastor, I've had to resist the temptation to open up my Bible and give little sermonettes to my children, even though, you know, it's something I would like to do. But I don't want to push them away. So instead, what we, what we do and have done is talk about Scripture. What does this mean? What does this have to say? So that it's a more informal gathering that they can learn from. Songs. Um, I, I love music. Most of us do. And so um, one of the things I can do with my children is spend time with them musically. I can't play anything, but we listen to music together. So, and we're interested in some of the same kinds of music, some of the same artists in that that helps bridge that relationship, and I encourage you to find those bridges as well. Life experiences. You know, my children know about my salvation, that I was 20 and those things that I shared last week, and, and they know some of the steps along the way in my journey with Christ and some of the failures and successes, and they, they need to hear that from you too, Dad. And then my personal favorite way, it doesn't have to be yours, but my favorite avenue is teachable moments. Teachable moments. And this is something that you're going to have to, if you're not used to this, you're going to have to practice on it and get used to it. Because I didn't employ it in my life until the last about five years. 
But I have found to sort of have a scanner on going in my brain when I'm in, in, with my family, particularly my children. And if we're watching something or we're going somewhere or I see somebody do or say something, I, I sort of filter it through a teachable moment. Is this a teachable moment? And if you, if you do teachable moments, you know, on the hour, every hour, it's not going to work. So you have to pick and choose your spots. But teachable moments are moments that you can reinforce something that's going on that's positive, that's of God. Or if it's not of God, you can use it as a teachable moment to say why it's not and ask your child or children what would they do if this happened to them. And it's a very teachable moment, one that will leave an impression on them, one that will stay with them, and they will learn from that. But in all these things that I've shared, it all comes back to simply making ourselves available, spending time with our children. If you want to be Father of the Year, and I hope that's your desire, then you've got to spend time with your children because spending time with them says that you care. Spending time with them says that you love them. That's the first step. The second step, if I want to be Father of the Year, is that I've got to set a good example. I've got to set a good example for my children. Jesus talks about this uh, in John chapter 15 and verse 15. Jesus is speaking and he says, I have given you an example to follow, do as I have done. Now, in this verse, in this passage, if you go back and look at John chapter 15, the setting is that Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says to his disciples, um, you've seen me. You've seen me model all the things that I've been teaching and preaching. So you've, seen, you've heard me, but you've also seen me live it out. Now, disciples, I want you to go out and do the same, live the same, speak the same. Jesus was their role model, and he expected them to do it with other people so that they would learn and carry on the process. This principle applies to us fathers. See, as we look to our Heavenly Father as our role model, as our example, then we should emulate that so that our children look to us in the same vein, that we are the role model, the example because as Andy pointed out earlier, um, your children are going to watch you. They are watching you. And they are going to emulate you. They're going to speak your thoughts. They're going to speak your words. There was a TV show on years and years ago. It was a TV show where a host would ask a child a question and he would answer and they'd go through this for a while. Sort of a question and answer series. And on this particular episode, the uh, host asked this child you know what does your dad do and the kid said well my dad's a termite man he, he kills termites that eat up houses and the host said well now have you ever seen a termite and the kid said oh yeah we got lots of them at our house and the host was shocked by this and he said you do I isn't your dad worried i mean isn't he concerned that the termites are going to eat up your house and the kid said nah my dad doesn't care we're just renting the place anyway Now, that kid couldn't have come up with that on his own. See, he had to have in some way heard that from the Father. The Bible, though, teaches us to be a good example, a good role model. We dads are to set the example. I just share my own heart for a moment. Um, it is my desire that my own daughters, when they're grown and on their own, I hope that they will look back to me as a good role model, not a perfect one. I have weaknesses and I make plenty of mistakes. But I do hope that they'll be able to look back on my life and my parenting, my being a father, as a role model, as an example for them. I want them to be able to go into their own future families having seen their dad pray. I want them to go into their future families having seen their dad read the Bible, study the Bible, know what God has to say. I want them to go into their future families knowing that their father loves God and serves God, loves people, serves people. That's the example that I want to set for my daughter so that they have a model in which to go by. I want my daughters, when they have their own families, to be able to look back and, and say, you know, my dad had a good time in life. He enjoyed life. Let me share with you dads for a moment a chilling thought. 
Are you ready for this? Our kids are going to look at our Heavenly Father in a similar way that they look at us. Now, I want you to catch this now. Most people, not everyone, but most people, their perception of God is based on the reality of their father. I told you a little while ago, my dad's in his 60s, and I'm 37. And I was raised in a good home. Didn't have a perfect father, but I'm not a perfect father, but he was a good father, and I love my dad, and he loves me. I'm the youngest of seven. And as I've looked at, uh, back over my life, I, 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 there was a certain part of my personality I couldn't quite figure out, and I think I've gotten a handle on it now. Um, when I was in school, um, I was obsessed with, uh, you know, making straight A's, being the best at sports. I mean, I, I had to excel. There was, n n there was nothing else allowed. I brought that into adulthood. As I look back on my life, I wonder why I did that. And I think I know why I did that. I think it was because I was trying to win the approval and the love of my father. And you know what? I have a seminary degree. I've been a Christian for 17 years. I pastored a church. You would think of all people I would be able to get past that, but I want you to know I still struggle with that with my own heavenly father. I still struggle with that. I know that he loves me unconditionally, that there's nothing that I can do or don't do that's going to change that at all, and yet I still find myself wanting to excel, to be able to say, Daddy, I did this. Look what I did for you. And that perception comes from the reality of my own father. Dads, I don't want to put anything heavy on you, but you need to know that your children, myself included, my daughter's perception of the Heavenly Father is going to be based to some degree on the reality of who I am. And the same is true for you. Isn't that a chilling thought? So I want to give you three ways of setting a good example. So that as, as much as possible, they will see in you an accurate picture of God, the Heavenly Father. First of all, love Christ. Love Christ. You know, I've got to tell you, kids are very perceptive. They, they know if you love Christ or not. They know if... There's love in your heart. They, my daughters know it about me, whether I do or I don't. They're going to know it about you. And so it's got to begin with loving Christ. Then the second thing is, and it works with the first one, is live for Christ. Live for Christ. They, they've got to know that He's important in your life. That church is important, that ministry is important, that caring for others is important. They've got to see it in you. It's not just enough to talk about it, although that's important. They've got to see you living it out. They've got to see me living it out. So we've got to love Christ. And we've got to live for Him. And then this third one is so important. You've got to enjoy life. And then does it, that's not pie in the sky stuff. You're going to have problems and crises. I've had my share of them, and they're still going to come. But I can still enjoy life. I can still have a good time. And I'm going to. And no one can stop that. I'm going to have a good time. I, ha I didn't ask my daughters this. I'd be curious to hear their comments later. I didn't ask them this, but my guess is if, if, if you were to ask them what they like best about their dad, and probably a short list, but if you were to ask them what they like best about their dad, my guess is that they would say that their dad enjoys life, that their dad likes having fun. Now, because you see me mostly in this setting, you don't see me pulling pranks and acting goofy and that kind of stuff but uh, around my family and others I do it's a big part of who I am because I love having a good time the other night I um, I shouldn't have done this but I, I it just tickled me um, the lights went out at our home in our neighborhood and uh, my daughter went out to the car in the garage and she had a flashlight with her and <laughs> and uh, I just couldn't resist I went out and hid next to the car <laughs> And when she came around, and bah, I jumped out, and if she had a gun, I'd be dead. <laughs> and we hugged and laughed, and it was, you know, it was, well, I enjoyed it. I'm not sure she did, but. 
You know, we just have a, have a good time. And I think that's important because as adults, here's what happens. We get so locked into our careers or whatever we're doing, our interests, and we tend to be so serious all the time. Lighten up. Don't take yourself so serious. Enjoy life. You know, Jesus said he came to give us life, that's salvation, but he didn't stop there. He said he came us to give, a, give us a, a, an enjoyable life, an abundant life. And that's having a good time. Now, I want you to see how these three lock into each other. See, when you love Christ and you live for Christ, you can't help but enjoy life. It, it all comes together. It all works together. And do you see the kind of picture that makes of our Heavenly Father? And I think that's an accurate portrayal of who He is. And if you want to be the Father of the year in your children's life, set a good example for them to follow. Then the third step is I've got to honor the mother of my children. I've got to honor the mother of my children. Ephesians 5, 25 says this, Husbands, love your wives with the same love Christ showed the church. Now, I want you to focus on the phrasing that I use there, honor the mother of my children. That may sound a little strange to you, but I want to share with you why I chose that wording. Some of us here are, live, are in blended families. And so the children, may, their mom may live outside the home. And so you can't love her, the mother, like you should be loving your wife. And that's why I chose this wording, because if you want to impact your children, you, you better make sure you're honoring their mother, whether they're in your home or not. It's important that the, chi that the child, the children, see in their dad somebody who is honoring their mom. Here's why. Your children and my children, let me do it this way. My daughters, and if you have daughters, are, are going to um, believe that their role as a mother and wife is based on what they see out of the father, how he treats. I mean, my daughters are going to grow up expecting similar treatment from their future husbands based on the way I treat their mother. If I had sons, and I don't, some of you do, your sons are going to figure out how to treat their future wife based on the way you treat your wife or his mother. Does that make sense? That's why it's important that you honor the mother of your children. See, when mom and dads come together with love, respect, and honor, it teaches the children, our children, what a healthy marriage is or what a healthy relationship is and the way God intended it to be. So let me just share with you a couple ways that you and I can honor our children's mother. The first thing is treat her with respect. Treat her with respect. Regardless of, of, of the situation, regardless of your relationship with her, hopefully it's wonderful, but if it's not, regardless of that, you are to treat her with respect. And the second thing is to speak positive about her. I can't tell you how often I've heard people speak poorly of the spouse or the, the, the mother or the father that's no longer in the home in front of their children and the damage that that does. And so when they say, well, they deserve it because they really are this, this, and this, and this, that's, that's beside the point. It's beside the point. You've got to treat her with respect and speak positively about her, especially in front of the children. And I'm going to tell you, if you commit yourself to doing that, it'll have a positive impact on your children's lives. See, if you and I, dads, if we want to earn Father of the Year Award, we've got to give our children time. We've got to set a good example for them. And we've got to honor their mother so that when they get older, we can look at them and smile and say, they did grow up just like me. And it will be a positive thing about them and about us. It will be a compliment. And by committing ourselves to these three steps, you and I can have the impact 
and the kind of relationship that the father and son have in this video. The one memory that I always think about with my dad is uh, during the summers we lived up north in the cottage, at a cottage. My dad would go to work Monday through Friday and then he'd try to cut out a little early on Friday and come up for the weekend. Most of the time when I was real small I fell asleep before he got up on Friday night but I could always count on Saturday morning he and I were going to do our routine of getting up in the morning. He was going to wake me up before anybody else and he and I were going to walk downtown uh, Lake City, Michigan and we would just go for a walk and have a good chunk of time together and we got the same thing every time. We split an order of toast and I got a hot chocolate and he got a cup of coffee and that's probably one of the most significant memories as far as just time with my dad because it was consistent. He demonstrated, first of all, his love for God was very clear. Um, as I grew up there was no no questions in my mind uh, what my dad stood for and who was first in his life. It was very clear to me um, my dad's selfless attitude in the way he raised us. It was quite clear that I was a very high priority in his life and he was consistently putting me or my other family members before his desires and his wants. In the late 70s, early 80s, my dad was working construction at the time, and uh, we lived in a very nice home in Farmington Hills, uh, but money-wise, things were tight, and the best job opportunity my dad had at the time was in New York City. What I didn't realize, and I didn't find out until much later in life, once I'd started a family of my own, is that during that time, he lived in his car, he basically slept in the car and would send his paycheck home. He was sacrificing himself, but we didn't even know. Uh, it wasn't something that he wanted us to know. He just did that. The real basis of our relationship was the, the true family togetherness. Just knowing uh, how special he was to me. Ah, I mean, I respected him, appreciated him. He knew what he did uh, would be fine. I mean, uh, whatever his uh, level of excellence was, it was great. I've seen what joy that's given him later in life, the relationship that we have today. I want Curtis, my son, to feel about me the way that I feel about my father. And that doesn't happen just by saying the right words every once in a while when you get an opportunity. It comes from the way you live over a long period of time. The way he treated my mom. Um, he treated her as precious. And um, there was no mistaking who she was in his life. And so as a teenager, if I ever got out of line, if I smarted off to my mom, you know, as a normal kid would, he was not so much in a way to reprimand me, but in a way of protecting his wife. He said, you know, basically made it very clear, you don't treat my wife like that. Um, it wasn't, you don't treat your mother. And um, just as, as a husband now, seeing um, his acceptance of my mom, the way she is and loving her and cherishing her has been a great example for me as a husband and a father. This shows even though the days that we're looking at. Today my dad and I work together. 
and um, it's it's really unique for a father to be able to come in and work in a son's business and uh, be able to get along as well as we do. And, um, I feel extremely blessed and the legacy that he has laid because of his love and his commitment to his family will just continue. The relationship that we have um, couldn't be the way it is today unless he lived the way he did for so many years. And the decisions he made were just right decisions. And the relationships he has now with his grandkids, with me, is because of the way he lived for so long. And the joy of his life now is seeing his kids and his grandkids raised. The lesson he's given me on being selfless or to put your family before yourself um, and to make sure you love God with all your heart has clearly come from him. And at times, I hope I can live up you know, to the example he's been for me. Um, you know, I, I want to, I want to love my kids, love my wife, the way I saw him. I could very well end the message on that note, and I think it would be a powerful example and reminder to us fathers, but I think I would be missing out and you would be missing out if I didn't include one final thing, and that is how should we respond to our fathers? I've talked about how we as dads, as fathers, the steps that we can take, but how should we respond to our father? I just have one main idea, and I, and I think if all of us will respond to our Father in this one way, the relationship that we have will improve uh, and, and really be priceless. And here it is. Obey and honor my Father. How should I treat Him? How should I respond to Him? By obeying and honoring Him. Let me tell you something. Your Father loves you. And your father has your best interests at heart. Your father is not perfect. There's no father here that is. But he does love you. And he does have your best interests at heart. He wants what's best for you. So how can we demonstrate obedience and honor to our fathers? Let me give you some suggestions. First of all, listen to him. Listen to what he has to say. He has some wisdom and some intelligence and you need to listen to what he has to say. The next thing is do what he asks. Follow the rules. This is particularly for people um, younger than 17 that are at the home. Because sometimes your dad's going to say things and has rules and regulations that you're not going to like, that you think are not correct or whatever. If you want to love him and honor him and, and, and follow that through, then you need to do what he's asking you to do, whatever the rules may be. The next thing is very important, forgive him. See, some of us are still hung up on some things our fathers did in the past, and we need to forgive him for that, and we need to forgive him in the present if he does something that's not correct. Forgive. Very important. Forgive. Next thing is love him and tell him. Tell him that you love him. Now, most dads, uh, it is believed by many people, you know, don't like the mushy stuff, but I'm going to tell you, most dads are moved when their ch children or child says, I love you, and they need to hear that from you. Next thing is, be proud of him. Be proud of him. You know how you can best demonstrate that is by telling others, you know, my dad is good at this, this, or that, whatever it is, or the qualities in your dad that you like. Whatever the positives are in your dad, tell other people that. And it's, it's having pride in your father and telling others about him in whatever ways that make him special or unique. Um, one of my favorite movies uh, is the movie Armageddon. Maybe you have seen it. I've seen it a number of times. I have it on tape. I love that movie. Powerful movie. In this movie, one of the best things about it is the relationship that exists between the father and the daughter. It could have easily have been a son. The principle's still the same. 
But in this particular movie, um, it's the relationship between the father and the daughter that's so moving, just, just touches the, the, the heart. And, and I, I truly believe that this kind of relationship is something that all of us as dads should strive for, to have this special kind of relationship with our children. Let me tell you a little bit about, about this movie. Um, Bruce Willis is the main character named Harry Stamper, and they've uh, sent him and a crew um, to an asteroid that's coming towards Earth, and they want to blow up the asteroid so it doesn't demolish Earth. And in order for him to accomplish his job, once he gets there, he realizes he's got to sacrifice his own life. He's got to give up his own life in order to save the world. And towards the end of the movie, as this reality sets in, and the last few moments of his life, he's able to have a conversation with his daughter. And his daughter expresses the love and admiration that she has for her father. Let's see that. I cannot believe this is going down like this. You all right? Up two men's locked. Pressure locked. Engine board is great. Houston, do you copy? This is Harry Stamper. Restart. Houston, we're out of here in T minus three minutes. Daddy? Hi, Gracie. Hi, honey. Grace, I know I promised you I was coming home. I don't under understand. Looks like I'm gonna have to break that promise. I am. Um... I lied to you, too, when I told you that I didn't want to be like you. Because I am like you. And everything good that I have inside of me, I have from you. And I love you so much, Daddy. And I'm so proud of you. I'm so scared. I'm so scared. I know it, baby. But there won't be anything to be scared of soon. Gracie, I want you to know that AJ saved us. He did. I want you to tell the chick that I couldn't have done it without him. None of it. I want you to take care of AJ. <laughs> I wish I could be there to walk you down the aisle. I'll look in on you from time to time, okay, honey? I love you, Grace. I love you, too. Gotta go now, honey. Daddy, no. No, no, Dad, no. Special kind of relationship that can happen between father and child, whether it's son or a daughter. Dads, let me challenge us to make a commitment today to try to win Father of the Year in the eyes and the hearts and minds of our children. And I'm convinced that if we'll just simply follow these three steps, we'll be Father of the Year in their eyes. This being Father's Day, let me encourage you to take this day, seize this day, to tell your Father that you love Him. Would you join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the example that you set for us. Thank you for loving us. Help us be the same kind of father to our children that you are to us. Forgive us when we fail. Strengthen us when we're weak. Rejoice with us in our strengths and in our victories. Help us to love our children and to express that love so that they'll know what you are truly like. Thank you for the day and the blessings that it brings. I thank you for our earthly fathers who love us and mean so much to us. May they be 
honor today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you some uh, hopefully brief announcements. The yellow sheet that you have in your worship folder is about promise keepers. If you've never been to a promise keepers, you don't know what you've missed. It's powerful stuff. Uh, it is for men. Uh, men defined as teenagers on up. It doesn't. You don't have to be an, a, an adult. So any of you young guys that want to go, you're more than welcome to go. Um, uh, they're having a rally on July 7th and 8th. It's a Friday evening and then all day Saturday. I sure encourage you to go. Um, there are several of us going. Um, it's $69 that needs to be paid today if you want to go with us. Um, you, you can show up at the gate if they still have openings and still get in. But if you want to go with us uh, as a group, uh, please take care of that today. And on your check, be sure it says the PK rally so we'll know. And it is $69, and if you'll put that in the offering basket when it comes around in just a moment. Um, and then I'll follow up with you on some of the details. Uh, music to Live By tape series. Since this is our last uh, message today, um, this will be available next week. I've got everything ready to go. I just needed today's message to copy and put in here. This will have eight of the nine um, messages, and uh, so you're welcome to get this beginning next week. It's going to be $12 for the uh, set. Um, everyone have this white piece of paper in your worship folder. If not, please get one. Discovery Fellowship Summer Supper Club. Um, please read this uh, and, and fill this out. You don't have to do it today, although you're welcome to. I'd like for you to, but we'll have this uh, next Sunday as well. We want everyone, members and guests, it doesn't matter, we want you to be a part of our Summer Supper Club. We're going to have uh, supper at someone's home every Friday and uh, give us a chance just to get to know each other better and to fellowship together. Um, July 2nd, the evening service. You may recall that we every the first Sunday of every month we have an evening service. Well, in July, which is the 2nd, um, in the evening we're not going to have a service, but we are going to get together, and it's going to be what I call movie night, and we'll do this on occasion throughout the year. Um, this uh, first one we're going to see is a guy by the name of Dennis Swanberg. He's actually a comedian, and uh, if you've never uh, seen Dennis, you, you be, be ready, because anyone here a knee slapper? I am, so don't sit around me because I'll knock you out. But um, uh, it's hilarious. It's about an hour long. We're going to gather about 6.30. We're going to have popcorn and probably some nachos and some soft drinks or whatever out front. And then we'll come in here about 7 and watch that. It's about an hour. You're going to have a great time. Wonderful time to bring family and friends, those maybe that are a little reluctant to come to church. It'll be a great time to, to bring them because they'll, they'll enjoy it and have a good time. I want to take just a moment to thank some people. Um, there are some of you here this morning that have been helping out over at the children's area. Some of you here have been very faithful to help out front and, and get that set up and parking attendants and putting signs out. Um, I tell you what, we, we owe you a debt of thanks and gratitude for the work that you do so that the rest of us uh, feel wanted and everything is done just right. So thank you so much for the work that, that you do. And I also want to say a special thank you to our worship team. Um, let me tell you what, they not only are doing all the new songs that they do every week, but learning these um, classic tunes is not an easy thing. Very few bands can do that. So I just want to honor all you workers. <laughs> Next Sunday, I will not be here, um, so we'll have a packed house. 